for several weeks now, I keep seeing these videos come out. Um, and one just came across my desk this morning. Um, somebody wanted to post to a, a group that I manage. And um, she's maintaining she's had thousands of hits and wanted to share several things that people say the church teaches that uh, Jesus said or that um, the Bible says that it doesn't really say. And I quit after the very first one. She started from number seven and, and um, was going to go forward. And I want to clarify this. And this is what I responded, um, not in as much detail, but I responded underneath her YouTube video. But she's maintaining that nowhere in the Bible does it teach that the tribulation is a seven-year period. So I wanted to clarify that we have not been incorrect about this for many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years. So where does the seven-year tribulation come from? Where do we get this idea? Well, we get this idea when we go to the scriptures. Let me pull up some verses for you. This isn't just something that somebody pulled out of their hat. Um, let me go here real quick. Let me do it this way. Here we go. Um, I hope you can see that. I zoomed my browser to about, <laughs> I don't know what percentage, but I wanted to make it clear. Now, we're, here we're in uh, Daniel chapter 9. In chapter 9, um, Daniel is in distress because the nation's in bondage and uh, enslaved again. He's praying, and uh, Gabriel comes, in, and it's often called the, uh, the, the 70 weeks of Daniel prophecy, but really it's Gabriel's prophecy given to Daniel. It's the Lord sent Gabriel to give Daniel this prophecy, which of course he didn't understand right away, and it, it took some time for him to comprehend it. Um, but it starts off, and you can see the heading. I don't know what your Bible says right here. Uh, mine says um, the 70 weeks. Why is it called the 70 weeks? Well, because in verse 24, that's what Gabriel said. Seventy weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. And then he explains in what ways. Now, let's stop there with the 70 weeks, the term weeks. Um, here's an interesting note. Let me click on that and see what the footnote says. Or, or sevens, 70 sevens. So that is closer to the Hebrew, 70 sevens. Uh, but a week a term that they might use in Hebrew is very similar to the way we in the Western world would use the word dozen. In other words, it means a grouping of 12. You could say a dozen days, a dozen donuts, a dozen whatever. So it's a grouping of seven. So 77s are decreed upon your people and your holy city to finish their transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for iniquity, to bring everlasting righteousness, to see both vision and prophet and to anoint a most holy place. There's a lot, we could spend a lot of time there to unpack that. But the point I want to get at without unpacking all the rest of that um, was that there's a, several groupings of, of sevens here, and Daniel is having this broken down for him by Gabriel in sections. And he says the 70 weeks, 70 groupings of seven, are about your people. Who's Daniel's people? Well, Israel. Abraham is a, a child of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob's name was later changed to Israel, to the people of Israel. So it's about your people and your holy city. What's their holy city? Jerusalem. So this is about your people and the city in the land of Israel, and that's what this prophecy is about. And so Gabriel spends some time and, and gives Daniel a whole spread of What's going to happen in your future, the major events? So he's going to give them a, a broad layout of what goes on um, during this period. And um, so not to, to belabor how you break that down and all that it's about uh, the 70 weeks of Daniel. Um, many books have been written and there's much to be said about it. And I've probably even done a video or two. But the main thing is where do we get the seven-year tribulation? So anyway, let's, let's skip down to where we see this. Um, let, let, we could pick up in verse 26, and after the 62 weeks, it's been broken down in a couple different ways. And, and then Gabriel tells Daniel, after the 62 weeks, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing. Um, 
cut off. That's a term for being uh, murdered, and that's about Jesus. So he's being um, murdered and shall have nothing. And the people of the prince who's to come um, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Its end shall come with a flood, and to the end there shall be war. Desolations are decreed. Now, with most Bible prophecies, there are echoes. There's a, a, a near completion, and then there's a far completion that is more complete. There's a near fulfillment, I should put, it's not really complete. There's a near fulfillment that's part way or takes us part way in and then stops. And then in the future, it's we see it resumed. And we shouldn't be surprised that there's a, a there are gaps like this. There are lots of gaps like this in the Bible. We see Gabriel again talking to Mary and giving Mary a gap about Jesus and who her son's going to be and how he's going to save the world, and then he's going to sit on the throne of David. Um, the throne of David is in Jerusalem. He hasn't done that. That's about a future kingdom that hasn't happened yet. So there's a 2,000-year gap. Jesus did the same thing when he was uh, quoting from the Isaiah scroll early in Luke. He opens it up and and um, he reads part way into what he's doing with his first advent, his first visitation, and the things he's going to accomplish. He stops literally mid sentence in Isaiah, rolls up the scroll and puts it back, and everybody's wondering what's going on. And he says that this day, this is fulfilled in your midst. What he's talking about is himself. But if you go back into Isaiah and you look at the passage he's quoting, the rest of Isaiah talks about kingdom things. So there's a 2,000-year gap. But, but Jesus stopped right in the middle of the sentence and says, this much is fulfilled in your midst. Obviously, the kingdom stuff that he talks about in the rest of Isaiah is in the future. So we got gap. we got this 2,000-year gap. we got everything up to the Messiah, up to the cross, up to the resurrection, and um, a, a bunch of things that don't happen for another couple thousand years. Um, at least, right? Because we're you know, we're at about a couple thousand years now. We don't know how much further it's going to go. We have some pretty good guesses. Um, but I'm, again, that's not the point of this video. Again, the point of this video is, well, how do you get a seven-year tribulation? So anyway, so what's going to happen? He says, he shall make a strong covenant with many for one week. Um, for So um, another grouping of sevens. Now, a lot of people will say this was about the year 70 A.D. Again, that's a partial fulfillment. It, we were brought up to that point, but nothing happened for this a seven-year period. Nothing happened for a seven-day period. Um, and for half of the week, he shall put an end to sacrifice and offering. So people struggle back and forth with this and try to say that, well, it was really about 70 A.D., but it's, it's not. Um, because... What happens is, is um, Jesus is talking about the rest of it, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate. People are trying to say that, well, Jesus is the one who, half a week, he puts an end to sacrifice because he died on the cross. Oh, really? So he's an abomination? Because it says, and on the wing of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until uh, the decreed end is poured out on the desolator. So Jesus, unless you're trying to say that he's the desolator, um, which I think is heresy, <laughs> a blasphemy. He's talking about um, somebody else. So this is where we get the abomination of desolation. So um, people debate that, but let's go on. Let's, let's look at another passage here. Um, let's look at Jesus himself talking about the tribulation, signs of the end of the age. Now, we know that in the previous chapter, in chapter 23, Jesus was in the temple and he's talking to the Jews, and he's explaining to them some uh, events that are going to go on. And then in, uh, we, he leaves the temple. We know this because right here it says, Jesus left the temple, was going away, when his disciples came to point out to him the buildings of the temple. So you're going to do that from the outside. So they left the temple. This is a different audience, different group, different situation. He's got four of his disciples with him. And we can name them. And they are in uh, Mark chapter 13, if you want to look. But he's got four of his disciples. Well, they might have all walked out, but eventually he sits down. And some of them ask questions, and we don't know if the other ones wandered away or what, but at least four are stuck with him. And so now he's going to be talking to these four. And this is the most detailed we get, much more detailed than we get in, in uh, Mark chapter 13. And they ask him a threefold question. It's not three questions. It's a threefold question. And um, he says, tell us, when will these things be? What will be the sign of 
uh, the coming uh, and uh, of your coming and of the end of the age. So Jesus answers these questions. Now, this is not a running chronology, um, starting off with how bad things are going to be in, in, in verse 4, Jesus answers them, and then finally when we get way down to the end of the chapter, he finally gets the end. No, because he mentions the end, and he mentions his coming, things like that. Some Really, he references the end about 13 times in this chapter alone. And uh, to complicate things for you a little bit more, a lot of people stop at the end of chapter 24. Well, his Olivet Discourse on the Mount of Olives outside the temple continues into chapter 25. So you want to make sure you read all of chapter 25 as well to get the full context of what he's talking about. And we know he's talking about the end because, um, and not 70 AD, because by the time you get to the um, well end, past the halfway point in chapter 25, you got the sheep and the goats judgment, and the goats he sends into outer darkness, and the sheep he says enter into my kingdom, and he sends them in. So we know he's talking about the end for that reason, too. But he mentions the end about 13 times, and so he gives um, snippets of different types of things that are going to happen and then the end. And then this is going to be happening, too, and then the end. So he's he does this several times. So you have to be very careful in the way that you are reading this. So anyway, about that abomination of desolation, let's look at what Jesus has to say about Daniel. So when you see the abomination of desolation of uh, um the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel. Um, standing in the holy place, let the reader understand. Well, one of the things you let the reader understand is Jesus is not the desolator. He's not the one who puts an end to the sacrifices. Here we've got the desolator ending sacrifices. Now, uh, this was also fulfilled uh, um, historically in many ways in a, in a kind of a foreshadowing through Antiochus Epiphanes. Um, Antiochus we knew, um, went into the temple. He erected a statue of Zeus. He slaughtered a pig on the altar. Um, and so we, we know that this happened a couple hundred years before Christ. Um, but this was kind of a foreshadowing of what, had to, what was to come. And again, these are fulfilled this way um, often. So Jesus comes along and he's saying, so when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by the prophet Daniel, so he's saying that that's, Antiochus was not the complete fulfillment of that. He's, Jesus is saying, but wait, there's more. And he certainly was not the desolator. He's not the one who's the abomination. Jesus is not the abomination. Okay, so 70 AD was not fulfilled by Jesus on the cross, stopping the sacrifices. He's talking about here a future tense kind of a thing. Um, Nero didn't do it. Nero did not go into the temple. And um, so, and there's not this grouping of sevens that happened around Nero either. So a lot of people will try to come up with different names and try to make it fit their theology and just read what the text says. So Jesus um, refer references Daniel here. He says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. So he's talking about an event where uh, something bad happens in the temple and um, the abomination of desolation that we know of as Antichrist um, and we'll, we see that in Second Thessalonians chapter 2, the man of sin. So he's in the holy place. He's the one who, who stops sacrifices. So um, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down to take what's in his house. Verse 18, let the one who is in the field not return um, back to, take his, to pick up his cloak. And alas, for the women who are pregnant in those days, uh, and who are nursing infants. Um, so he says, okay, verse 20, for then, at this time, in other words, there will be great tribulation. So the tribulation week, we should understand, um, is split in two, just as it says in Daniel, in the middle of the week. Well, here, Jesus talks about great tribulation. So in the middle of the week starts great tribulation. And, and we're going to see that in the book of Revelation. So there'll be tribulation. Great tribulation is right in the middle and has to do with temple events, such as has not been from the beginning of the world till now, no, and never will be. So this is another way we know that that wasn't 70 AD, because at that time, 
those days he's talking about here was the 70 AD. He says, for then there will be great tribulation just such as has not been from the beginning of the world until now. So in other words, this big event, this big horror of an event is going to be the worst time ever in history. Um, so no and never will be. And if those days had not been cut short, no human being would be saved. So this is the worst event that he's talking about that's ever been. So it was 70 AD worse than, say, let's look at after 70 AD. Was it worse than World War One? Was 70 AD worse than World War II? Especially for the Jews, the people that Daniel, Gabriel's giving this prophecy to Daniel and people in the city. What happened to the Jews in World War II? You know, at least 6 million Jews murdered in World War II. Uh, there was maybe over a million died, perhaps, I doubt it, but perhaps you might try to say that there could have been a million people in, World, in uh, 70 AD, but no, there really wasn't um, that many people who were slaughtered in 70 AD compared to World War II. Um, even if you said two or three million people, let's stretch it out, let's, let's exaggerate. Let's say it's five million people. Is that still as bad as World War II? No, there is not. So this time he's talking about is future to 70 AD even. Because nothing so far has been worse than World War II. So he's saying there's a time coming after World War II, apparently, that's going to be the worst time in history. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been from the beginning of the world till now, and Never will be, and there'll never be anything worse again, is what he's saying. So, this is yet in our future. After World War II, it has to be because Jesus said, did Jesus get it wrong? Clearly he did not. So, he talks about those um, events that are going to be happening, and it's the time of great tribulation. Now, we can spend a lot of time here again. Again, this is like Daniel 9. You can really open up hours and hours worth of discussion about all the nuances of this. So, we know it's um, it's a week or grouping of sevens. That sounds like a seven-year tribulation to me. We know we knew Jesus is talking about, uh, Daniel talked about middle of the week here. Jesus is talking about um, great tribulation, what happens, and talks about uh, all these temple events. Let, let's take a look here um, at some time periods in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, we've got um, two men who the Lord... Um, brings in to, um, they're going to prophesy for 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. 1,260 days is, is how long now? Three and a half years. So we're going to have, we know that we get temple um, at the beginning of the um, tribulation. Again, Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, we, we get this peace agreement um, from Daniel 9. We get the events in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 where the Antichrist, the man of sin, stands up in the temple in the middle of that time and declares himself to be God. So during this time, you've got the two witnesses and they're prophesying for 1260 days, three and a half years. So they're prophesying for three and a half years and... Um, what happens? Well, what happens in three and a half years is um, all of a sudden we've got the, a, a great sign in heaven, woman cl clothed uh, with the sun, moon in her feet, and on her head a crown of 12 stars. This is Joseph's dream from Genesis. In other words, we're talking about Israel here. We're not talking about Mary. Um, that doesn't fit the context. Um Another sign appeared in heaven, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. So this is uh, about Satan. And he's, he swept a third of the stars out of heaven, cast them to the earth. So he's setting up here in the prophecy in Revelation chapter 12. That this is this dragon um, is in a big battle. He uh, wants to attack the woman, Israel, and to devour it. Okay. Um, she gives birth to a male child one who's to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Um, and that would be 
that would be Christ in uh, Old Testament prophecies. So, um, but he uh, is caught up to God and to his throne. And that happened after the resurrection, right? Um, but here, we also have the woman fled into the wilderness, um, where she has a place prepared by God in which she is to be nourished for 1260 days. So here we've got chapter 11. We've got the two witnesses at the temple. They're preaching for three and a half years. And the events around that. And um, then we've got the, uh, the beast, the Antichrist, comes after them. Okay, after, th look at, and then after um, they lay dead in the street, and after three and a half days, breath of God enters into them in chapter 11, and they stand on their feet. And uh, everybody was afraid. Everybody had their cell phones out, right? This is, this is the way today. Everybody's doing this thing, going, oh, look at the two witnesses. So the whole world sees. And then they're caught up into the heavens, and then there's a great earthquake, and the city falls. And um, so they even, it's, it's so bad that after the two witnesses are killed, that um, rain is cut off, um, and their dead bodies lie in the street um, for three and a half days. And those, verse 10, and those who dwell on the earth... It means everybody. If you're dwelling on the earth, it's you. Another way we know the church isn't here because we're not going to be here to see this. There's our earth, earth dwellers. Those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and make merry and exchange presents because the two witnesses had been such a torment to them for um, um, torment to those who dwell on the earth. Let's see. Those who dwell on the earth, those who dwell on the earth. Verse 10, okay? So, the two witnesses are tormented to them, so they're exchanging presence. Now, some people will try to say, well, that the two witnesses were around during the uh, second half of the tribulation. Well, you're not going to be having a gift exchange in presence in the, at the end of the three and a half years at the second half. Because... Um, the bold judgments, you've had a CME scorch people, you've got darkness, you've got Armageddon, you know, um, getting ready to pop off. You've got um, man-sized hail has fallen from the earth. You've had um, major earthquakes even bigger than this, much bigger than this, that has leveled every mountain and sunk every island. And all the water even has turned into blood by the end of the tribulation period, the Great Tribulation. At the end of the seven years. So they're not going to be exchanging presents and rejoicing for any reason at the end. So the two witnesses came along right at the beginning. Um, were probably there when the Antichrist was having the temple built. And they're out there preaching and proclaiming even against this guy and warning people at the very beginning of the tribulation. Then by the time we get to the middle of the tribulation, we got the Antichrist um, who comes along. Um, Satan indwelling the Antichrist by this time and attacks them and kills them. So then we get chapter 12 and it's going to tell us a little bit about um, the dragon living inside of the Antichrist, now known as the beast. Satan is cast down to earth and in his anger um, he goes after them. And we see that um, uh, and the dragon Look at this, verse 13. And the dragon, uh, when the dragon saw that he had been cast down to the earth, he pursued the woman who had uh, given birth to the male child. And the woman was given the two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly um, from the serpent into the wilderness to a place where she is to be nourished for how long? A time, times, and half a time. One year, two years plus a half year, three and a half years. So we've got three and a half years here. We've got 1,260 days here. 
And then we also have another place um, in chapter 13, chapter 14, about 42 months, about the second half being 42 months. So here they're at the temple. The dragon's coming after her, and the, the Lord saves the woman uh, as, as the serpent's coming after her because um, he's furious with the woman, see? The dragon became furious with the woman and went off to make war on the rest of her offspring and those who keep the commandments of God because believers are going to come to know the Lord. So we've got these periods in terms of 1260 days, 42 months, and a time, times, and half a time. So that's where three and a half years comes from, plus three and a half years, which makes seven years, a grouping of sevens in Daniel chapter 9. So that's for your seven-year tribulation, without going into all the details of the timing of it. Um, it just shows that it is this period that we're talking about that's um, laid out in great detail for us in Revelation, the book of Revelation. Very specifically, um, beginning in chapter 6, when the Lamb of God himself opens up the seal judgments, and judgment starts pouring upon the earth. This is Jesus himself doing this. And um, judgment pours upon the earth, and, and by the end of the chapter, uh, of that chapter 6, which is at the very beginning, um, we start reading about the wrath of the Lamb, and people are in terror, um, running and hide because the, the wrath of the Lamb has come. And that goes all the way through chapter 19, where Christ returns to the earth. And uh, Jesus wraps everything up. And then there's the culmination. The culmination of all these Old Testament promises, Jesus' um, prophecies concerning himself and the Olivet Discourse. And then um, you know the culmination of all the events in, in chapter 19 before we start going into chapter 20 and 21 um, about the, the kingdom period. And uh, both those chapters are about the kingdom. And uh, so... That's your seven-year tribulation period, Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19. Um, grouping of sevens in Daniel 9, uh, three and a half years plus three and a half years equals seven. You got the temple events happening in the middle of the week um, and, and that, right before the great tribulation. So uh, I don't know how many different ways you can add it up, but, but vet that, check it out thoroughly. There is a seven-year tribulation in the Bible. I don't know how you get much more clear than that. Um, so study it for yourself. I gave you the passages. Like I said, the only one I didn't really go into about that is um, chapter 2 of Second Thessalonians. Um, read that about the man of sin coming and standing up in the temple to demand worship. We see that actually happen in Revelation chapter 13, and the beast demands, the false prophet comes along and builds an image in Revelation chapter 13, and in chapter 14 they really go together and to worship him, and whoever doesn't take the mark of the beast um, has no more resources for food or anything else. Um, so those who are alive on the earth right now, there's nobody right now, we're not in danger of the mark of the beast because there's no beast yet, so there's no mark of the beast to take. So we're not in danger. That does not happen until that seven-year tribulation period. And in particular, at the beginning of the, of the Great Tribulation, in the middle of the week, in the middle of the seven-year period. So um, seven-year tribulation, folks, it's there. Um, do some research. Don't take my word for it by any means, but um, search it out. I gave you the passages. Um, have fun with that. Uh, leave your comments, what your findings are um, below. If you have any questions below or need clarification, we can get into that. All right.